Okay. So I did it live. Okay. Tuesday, June 1st, 2021, 17 miscellaneous 605, Town of Concord versus Raz Musin. All right. Um, first of all, uh, I don't see Mr. Cooper. I don't see Mr. Nislik. They're here, Your Honor. Uh, we thought for purposes of you're not having to see all the squares, although we're happy to oh. fix that. I can ask them to all come up and stand behind me. They're all in the room with oh, me. Oh, they're in the room with you. Okay. Yes, they are. So uh, okay. I was going to introduce them. and But again, for purposes of uh, a little bit of uh, a fewer squares, we thought we would um, not have everybody in squares on your screen. Okay, that's fine. I just want to make sure everybody who needs to be you know, president of the trial is, is here, um, and that, that's fine. Um, our first order of business, of course, will be to swear in uh, our stenographer, Ms. St. Juan, good morning to you. Good morning. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will truly and faithfully transcribe and set down the testimony and evidence in this proceeding to the best of your ability? I do. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I'd like to note before we get started with anything else, we conducted a view of the subject premises in Concord, uh, actually going up into Carlisle on Friday, May 28th. Uh, and I'd like to ask if there are any objections to the view. None, Your Honor. Honor. Okay, great. And I'll, I'll take it that that applies to Mr. Nislik and Mr. Cooper as well. It does. <laughs> okay, I'll take your word for it. That's hearsay, though. Um, and also Harvard's okay. counsel, Your Honor. Oh, and oh, and Ms. Goodhart is—is is she in the room too? She is, as well as okay. uh, Gwen Nolan King. Yes. Okay. Well, welcome to everyone. Um, are there any housekeeping matters we need to discuss before we proceed with openings? Um, none from the town, Your Honor. Okay. Um, then. Uh, Ms. Allison, you may uh, proceed with your opening if you wish. I will, thank you, Your Honor. This case is about whether the public has a right of access to the disputed portion of Esterbrook Road, which is a trail that runs for about a mile and three quarters through Esterbrook Woods to the Carlisle Line. Your Honor walked the entire length of the trail during the view. The town's case for public access is premised on two propositions. First, that the public had a right of access to the disputed portion of Esterbrook Road prior to 1932. And second, that that right was not extinguished by the 1932 discontinuance of maintenance of the road pursuant to general law chapter 82, section 32A. That second point, the effect of the discontinuance under Section 32A, is a question of law that this court can determine from stipulated facts and exhibits in the record. On the first point, the town will offer evidence at trial to show that the public had a right to access Esterbrook Road, including the disputed portion, through the 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries. The evidence will show that some records about this ancient road have likely been lost, but the remaining records, the records that are still available to us today, tell a straightforward story. First, the town will offer evidence that the majority of the disputed portion of Esterbrook Road was laid out and recorded as an open way by the County Court of General Sessions of the Peace in 1763. That layout was accepted by Concord Town Meeting the day before the order of the county court. You will hear that the defendants agree that this county layout depicts a part of the disputed portion of Esterbrook Road with the exception of the final call in that layout. In other words, the parties agree that the layout document depicts some of the disputed portion of Esterbrook Road, but disagree on where that layout terminates. Your Honor will hear evidence that the 1763 layout in fact terminated at a then existing town way. The town will offer testimony of its expert land surveyor that that 1970, or sorry, the 1763 layout 
joined with that existing town way in an area south of Mink Pond, of what is now Mink Pond. The town will also offer evidence through its expert about this town way with which the 1763 layout joined. That road is referred to in the ancient records as the way by Benjamin Clark's. The location of Benjamin Clark's house is undisputed and your honor saw it during the view. You will hear evidence that the way by Benjamin Clark's <clears throat> um, ran by Benjamin Clark's house, not surprisingly, along what is now the southern portion of the disputed Estabrook Road, and that that way joined, connected with the 1763 layout in the area south of Mink, what is now Mink Pond, establishing a continuous open way to the public. The town will also offer evidence of town records, which indicate that the way by Benjamin Clark's was laid out and accepted at some time prior to the 1763 county layout, and that the town selectmen assigned to the highway surveyors responsibility for the repair and maintenance of that way by Benjamin Clark's, starting in at least the mid 1750s. Following the 1763 layout, the town will show that the town selectmen continued to assign to the highway surveyors the entirety of that continuous way from Benjamin Clark's house to the Carlisle, what is now the Carlisle town line. Those assignments continued annually from the mid 1750s <clears throat> um, until 1829 when the way by Benjamin Clark's to the Carlisle line was included in a highway district. In addition to the 1763 layout and this extensive collection of selectman assignments to the surveyor of highways, the town will offer evidence that it incurred ongoing expenses in the late 19th and early 20th centuries for the upkeep and maintenance of Estabrook Road. The town will also offer evidence that the selectman granted a petition from a utility company in 1899 to install utility poles along the entire length of Estabrook Road, reserving space on those poles for town wires. Your Honor will see that several of the agreed exhibits are official maps and plans from the 19th and 20th centuries depicting Estabrook Road. In addition to <clears throat> all of this evidence that I've described and that you will hear of actions by the county court and the town itself, the town will also offer testimony of an expert historical archeologist about the likely uses of Estabrook Road from the 17th century up to the early, early 20th century based on her observation of the road and the sites along the road, as well as historical research. The town's expert's testimony will address the topography and terrain around the disputed portion of Estabrook Road and in particular, Estabrook's high, dry, and central location through the North Quarter, what is now Estabrook Woods. Testimony about the stone walls running the length of the road and their bounding function to separate lots and enclosures from the road. The town's expert will also offer testimony on the farming resources available along the road in the colonial period and in the early 19th century. Um, including woodlots, meadows, and pasture land, and how that land was used. Our expert will offer testimony on the fragmented nature of the land holdings in the colonial period, requiring individuals to cross another's land continually to access their land holdings. Our expert will offer testimony about the Kibbe and the Estabrook cellar holes and the, and the uses of those sites as residences by 18th century farming families. And our expert will offer testimony about the lime quarries and the ruins of a lime kiln um, along the road, which was operated um, in the 18th to early 19th century. With respect to later in the 19th century and early 20th century, our expert will offer testimony that Estabrook Road is mentioned prominently in first-hand accounts, including the journals of Henry David Thoreau 
And such accounts attest to the continuing use of the road for certain agricultural purposes, as well as recreational purposes. In some, the town will rely on all of this evidence to establish that Esterbrook Road was used by the public continuously for more than two centuries prior to the discontinuance. The town's final witness will be the town clerk who will offer evidence regarding the state of the town's records from, in particular, from the 17th and 18th centuries um, and evidence of gaps in the records uh, concerning land in the North Quarter. So Your Honor, that concludes the summary of the evidence that the town will offer to establish that the public had a right of access to Esterbrook Road prior to the 1932 discontinuance of maintenance. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Allison. Ms. Tillotson and the other defendants counsel, do you wish to make an opening at this time? Yes, uh, good morning, Your Honor. Uh, Diane Tillotson for uh, Neil and Anna Rasmussen, uh, two of the defendants. I will be opening at this time. And after uh, me, Matt uh, Furman, on behalf of the Reed Kays and the Pippin Land Trust, will make a brief opening. Uh, counsel ha uh, for Harvard have elected to reserve their opening until after the plaintiff town of Concord has presented its case. Thank you. you may proceed. So with that, I will begin. Good morning. The town's position in this case. Oh, before I actually begin, I want to acknowledge my colleague, Vanessa Arslanian, who is going to be my tech support during both this opening and throughout the entire trial. So I just want to uh, acknowledge and thank her. The town's position in this case, that there is a public easement over the discontinued portion of Estabrook Road for a recreational walking trail and for no other purpose for which roads are ordinarily used is unusual to say the least. A piece of this road was conditionally laid out by Middlesex County as a private way in 1763. Much of the road, the entire Southern portion was never laid out. So let me, let me road, you right there and I'm sorry to do this. But um, until Harvard came back in the case, um, I guess the other defendants agreed on this issue that the 1763 layout does lay out a public way, but you didn't really care about that because it's not along your party's property. And so I, your I, position I, on that is different than Harvard's. Uh, I don't think so, Your Honor. And I think the only quibble I would have, I don't think there's a dispute in terms of the location of the northern part of the way. What is in dispute is whether it was laid out as a public or a private way. The lang as you will see, the language of the layout itself refers to a private way. There is some dispute among the parties as to what that meant in 1763, and I will acknowledge that the town has a different uh, position on that, and that that layout was, con was conditioned on, uh, on certain things happening, which it's defendant's position, and again, I think all the defendants share this, that those, there's no evidence that those conditions were ever met. All right, so the position that Harvard took in its supplemental pretrial uh, memorandum filed recently uh, the, the other defendants share that position or, or do you just take no position on it? No, we share that position. Okay. All right. Sorry for the interruption. Okay. And I, and I think I speak for all defense counsel. So, okay. Um, okay. great. No worries. The road uh, was never used except for the folks who owned property along it, nor was it maintained by the town or anyone else. And we will suggest that the evidence, contrary to what the town has told you, will show exactly that. And whatever its earlier status, the evidence will show that the disputed portion was officially discontinued in 1932 by the county that created it. In colonial times, as now, roads were laid out to accommodate necessary travel not to establish recreational walking trails. Requests for roads, as you will hear from witnesses 
and see from the historic documentary evidence were not always welcomed by the municipality. They cost money to build, they cost money to maintain, and even colonial statutes required payments for roads to landowners, unless those landowners willingly and voluntarily gave of their land. The evidence in this case will show that the northern portion of Estabrook Road, although conditionally laid out by the county in 1763, was, in the words of Henry David Thoreau, never truly accepted by the town or the traveling public. You will hear no evidence that the petitioners for the road, all of them in the far north in what is now Carlisle, gave of their land to create the road, a key condition of the 1763 document. I'd like to bring up one of the chalks we used on our view the other day and retrace our route as I describe some of the evidence that you will be hearing. You'll hear evidence that Estabrook Road has multiple parts. The northernmost portion of the 1763 layout from Nathaniel, Nathaniel Taylor's house to the present day Carlisle border was created so that people in what in the far in what was then the far north of Concord, and this is from uh, the town's own witnesses, could get to public worship. But worship where? The evidence will show that the land for the Carlisle Meeting House, which is where we started our view on Friday, was given to the inhabitants of Concord, Chelmsford, and Bill Ricca, some of them the very petitioners for the 1763 road layout for purposes of establishing a place of public worship in 1758, five years before the county layout in 1763. And there was a meeting house constructed there by 1760. You will hear the historic context for that from Ms. Heiterk, the town's witness, and then from Dr. D Brian Donahue, Harvard's expert witness and the foremost authority on Colonial Concord's land and uses. You will hear from Kevin Arsenal, defendant's expert land surveyor, who accompanied us on The View the other day, that the approximate distance from the house of Nathaniel Taylor is less than a mile from the Carlisle Meeting House. That same starting point for the 1763 layout, the house of Nathaniel Taylor, is a distance of four and a half miles to the Concord Meeting House. The town's own witnesses will confirm that although we do not know for sure the identity of the petitioners for the 1763 layout, based on the evidence that we do have, the land occupied by all of those petitioners is in the present town of Carlisle. And indeed, with the exception of Mr. Kibbe, who's right there on the border, those locations have been in the town of Carlisle since 1780. So let's continue with our view route. The 1763 conditional layout initially contained two layouts, the original route laid out by the Concord Selectman and a second route, which is today the road at issue, suggested by a county committee. The paths diverged right here at the gap in Ephraim Minot's fence. The original route led from that gap through Buttrick's pasture, and I, Vanessa has her cursor right on Buttrick's pasture, the approximate location, to an old road, a way already laid out, what is now Hugh Cargill Road, for which there is a town layout in 1746. You will hear much more about Mr. Buttrick from Harvard's witness, Dr. Donahue. The alternate route, suggested by the county committee, the one that was ultimately adopted by the town, also runs from the gap in Ephraim Minot's fence to a dam at David Brown's land, you recall that dam, and calls out black oaks, white oaks, rocks, and other similar physical monuments that to a land surveyor, to Kevin Arsenault, 
the defendant's land surveyor, that this portion was an entirely new road and not a layout over an existing path. As you heard on our walk, the parties agree on the location of David Brown's dam and also agree that in 1763, David Brown owned much of Swamp Oak Meadow, what is now Mink Pond, but nothing south of that meadow. The 1763 description ends at a quote, town way through David Brown's land. And we know from that call that the private road conditionally laid out in 1763 did not extend south of David Brown's land at approximately this location on our view chalk. So looking at our chalk, we have the distance from the south end of Mink Pond all the way south to Barnes Hill Road, which includes a considerable portion of the area in dispute with no layout whatsoever. This is a stipulated fact, agreed fact number 11 from the party's joint pretrial memo. So for a significant portion of the road, there is no layout or evidence of a layout, no petition, no votes, no town meeting warrants. There are paths to be sure, multiple paths, which we saw and explored on our view from what was leading from what was Groton Road in 1763, north through what was a sheep common of the proprietors of the 20 score. And the town will ask you to take a detour down one or more of these paths in an effort to create a narrative for this very large gap in the town's evidence. As Dr. Donahue will testify, these paths were used likely by the proprietors of the 20 score, but none of them were laid out as public ways. Coming to the end of our view route, there is a stipulation that reflects the distance from the discontinuance point at the Rasmussen Gate, right approximately there, to south to Barnes Hill Road. That portion is paved. It's approximately 2,344 feet. The length of roadway is maintained by the town and it isn't disputed in this case. And finally, there's no dispute that the very last portion of Estabrook Road from the intersection of Barnes Hill Road over to Liberty Street, where the cursor is now, approximately 1,390 feet is public, laid out in 1699 by the county as part of Groton Road. These undisputed portions will be particularly important in understanding the town's evidence of the surveyor of highway records. Wait, can you just repeat for me the part that's not in dispute about it being a public way from where to where? Yes, um, well, there's, there's two pieces. There's the part from the gate down to Barnes Hill Road. Mm -hmm. And that's not in dispute, although there is no layout for that portion. It's paved, it's been maintained by the town. We don't dispute that. It's part mm -hmm. of the, it's the road by Benjamin Clark, essentially, as you can see. And then there's a final leg of the route that goes from that Barnes Hill Road over to Liberty Street. That is also Estabrook Road. And that portion is public and was laid out by the county as part of Groton Road in 1699. Okay. And again, those two final portions, the undisputed portions are going to play a large role when the court is asked to review the surveyor of highway records and even more importantly, the maintenance records that Miss Allison alluded to, because those maintenance records with one exception are not specific as to location. And in all just, likelihood- I'm sorry, just the, 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 the part for which there is a layout. Yes. It's a 1699 layout. Yes. And it was called something else. It was called uh, Groton Road at that Groton time. Road. And it ends at Barnes. Well, it doesn't end there. It actually continues all oh, the way okay. over to Lowell Road. And, and you will hear some testimony about that. It's the part, but where, it, it's but, the part that is now today Estabrook Road. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, that's okay. 
I, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Um, and it, again, that those portions are important because they play a role in understanding what the town is attempting to present as maintenance records for the disputed portion of the trail. I can take down the chalk here. There's stipulated evidence that the entire disputed area of interest, that is the length of the unpaved trail that runs north to the present day Carlisle border was discontinued in 1932. And that discontinuance is repeatedly reflected in the town's records and maps. The evidence also shows that the disputed road in question was not shown on any map dating between 1763 and 1830, when a state statute, which the court will see in evidence, required that accurate plans of private ways as well as public ways be prepared. The road is shown on maps between 1830 and 1932, the year of the discontinuance, and then not shown on any town maps thereafter. Nevertheless, the, the town is asking you to find, based on conjecture and speculation, that the conditions for the 1763 layout were met as they pertain to the disputed area, despite any lack of evidence, that somehow the road from the southern terminus of the 1763 layout to the discontinued portion was dedicated and accepted. And even beyond that, that despite clear statutory language to the contrary and record evidence, some sort of implied recreational right of public access survived the 1932 road discontinuance and remains intact today. But the evidence will show that the town simply cannot prove all the facts on which its case depends. On behalf of all the defense counsel with me here this morning and our clients, I thank you for the time and attention that you will be giving to this case. And uh, I'll now turn it over to Mr. Furman. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. I'm Matt Furman. I'm Matt Furman, and along with attorneys Cooper and Nislik, I represent the Reed Kay and Rob families who are private property owners along the southern portion of this trail. I just want to briefly provide you with the proper lens that, as we see it, for how to assess the evidence in this case and how it affects our clients' properties. Your Honor, this is a case in which we will be asking you to distinguish between actual evidence and facts versus the speculation and conjecture <laughs> offered from the town's experts, which in many instances is not even within the expertise from which it will be offered. The town has the burden of proof here. Uh, and what you will hear from the town will literally ask you to make leaps of faith from one point on a map to another with any actual evidence, uh, direct or circumstantial. This 1932 discontinuance that Ms. Tillotson mentioned a minute ago only matters if the town can first demonstrate to you that this way became public uh, at some point in the 450 years of history that you're gonna be asked to survey. A preponderance, however, is more than mere speculation or conjecture. It's more than historical theories or possibilities, which one might discuss at a history symposium. Equal chances of yes and no aren't enough. The town has to demonstrate to you that it is probable that a public way was established over our client's property in the first place. As to the Southern portion, your honor, the town does not have a layout to put into evidence. No witness, fact or expert is going to testify at this trial that they've seen one. No witness can testify that one existed and was lost. Of course, as you will hear the town's first witness, Mr. Venosi, a land surveyor, had originally opined that he had found one. Uh, and the town swore to that fact in an interrogatory answer. But he was then forced to withdraw that opinion based on actual evidence and facts. Uh, and similar guesswork from the town has then taken that faulty opinions place. 
The town is going to throw 450 years of history at you, including Thoreau's journals, and ask you to speculate that the southern portion was either laid out before there even was a layout statute, or otherwise somehow became public at a point in time that the town cannot specify. As one example only, the town is going to put a historic archeologist on the stand, Ms. Heitert, who does not know how a road becomes public, what a public road is, or what a layout is. And she's going to ask you to presume that Thoreau, a land surveyor, who we all came to know in school as a writer of painstaking detail, purposefully ignored details of public use of this trail. As you listen to her testimony, please ask yourself, on what basis does this archeologist purport to opine on Thoreau's writing and what he did not include? What cannot carry the burden of proof here, Your Honor, is this sort of ipsy dixit. It's not about showing that a theory is possible either. The town's burden here is to show you that what it's claiming is probable and they simply are not going to have the evidence to get there. There's a difference between speculation and circumstantial evidence. They cannot use nothing but the former, even a lot of it, to show the latter. By contrast, Your Honor, the defendants are going to collectively present to you the facts. We're going to show you that there was no layout over the southern portion of the trail. And although it does not relate specifically to the Reed K and Rob properties, you also see an absence of proof that the conditions on the layout for the northern portion were ever met. Similarly, you'll see no dedication and acceptance by the town, and there is insufficient evidence to show prescription, especially by a municipality with its more significant proof requirements. As to the southern portion in particular, the town is not going to be able to demonstrate to you who used it, what uses were made of it, when it was used, why it was used, or how it was used for any point in time, nevertheless, 20 consecutive years. And like every other effort in the Commonwealth to date, the facts are going to be inadequate to demonstrate to you public, that this was a public way based on circumstantial evidence, assuming one can even do so, which is the point that the defendants dispute. The southern portion of this trail is just one of many ancient paths first in this area first used by colonial proprietors. This one never became a public way. The earliest colonists of Concord had paths like these 450 years ago that allowed them to conduct their daily lives. Nobody disputes that. But the courts, including in Fenn, have instructed that a ways age does not make it public. And nobody claims that every path that the colonists use that has survived into this century is. This is why we have law and what it takes to demonstrate that a way has become public. The town simply isn't going to be able to show you by a preponderance of the evidence that this trail ever became a public way. Uh, my clients and I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Furman. So I take it that's the end of the closings. Openings. The openings, Your Honor. I mean, I'm sorry. I oh, sounded I'm, like a closing. I was being optimistic. <laughs> I know you want to fast forward to this. Right. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I revealed myself. Um, <laughs> okay. Ms. Allison, uh, you may proceed with your first witness. All right. We're going to ask him to join the meeting now, Your Honor. Do you need a few minutes? Uh, just two minutes. He's just we're going two to... minutes, Your Honor. All right. We'll take. We'll. We're this. Generally, what we've been doing is taking a few minutes in between witnesses so you can get yourselves set up. Uh, so we'll take five minutes um, for this, okay? Thank you, Your Honor.